your night church family and welcome to another episode of Tuesday Night Bible Study. Thank you so much for joining us again for another quick discussion on the word and some things in relation to God. Tonight, as you could see from the opening screen, we're going to talk about something um, that interestingly Jesus' mother said to him. And from there, we are going to extrapolate things in relation to obedience to the word and doing things according to God's will. But of course, before we get into all of that, we're going to have a bit of song and then a prayer. And then we get right into Tuesday night Bible study.
us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for bringing us to another night of fellowshipping together and learning more about your word. You are the great I am, the everlasting king, the prince of our lives. Help us to navigate our way in such a manner that it will please you, that we will find that your word is truth, that we will find that the very nature of doing things to how you would entail it to go, it's the better part. Help us to see you as our shepherd. Help us to see you as our friend. But also assist us to be obedient. Not just listen to your word, to be obedient to it. To not just be hearers of your word, but be doers of the word also. And so we will bring more peace and more love and more kindness and more of what you intend into the world. Amen. Thank you everybody for joining us for Tuesday night Bible study again. As you could see, we're going to be talking from the topic, do whatever he tells you, which is actually from something that Jesus' mother said to him at his first ever miracle, which was at the wedding of Cana. We'll obviously get into that as we progress. But before we get there, please do note that... Tuesday night Bible study from the Hellshire United Church happens every Tuesday night streaming on uh, both our Facebook and our YouTube pages at 7.30 p.m. But do note we have Sunday service which happens at 9 a.m. every Sunday as well and it streams on our Facebook page. You will see some details in relation to the church uh, periodically pop up or maybe even streaming at the bottom of the uh, video here and those are the ways that you can contact us if you need to in uh, any happenstance of things that you may require some assistance with please also note that uh, we do have prayer and fasting on saturdays every saturday between 7 and 9 a.m in the sanctuary of the church itself we are on a little break from uh, church school but when we reduce do restart we will be having it after church ends usually and we will get more details as that time comes to be please also do note that the auxiliaries of the church meet generally between friday and the weekend the notices in relation to these things will be given either in church or through your secretaries of your auxiliaries as well as uh, the, the different uh, main representatives thank you very much for tuning in tonight all protocols observed you know god finds a way to bring us back to ourselves. i guess i could say which is really back to him when we stray he also finds ways when we're unsure of ourselves to give us these little indications of his presence he tends to come in at points when we are not quite understanding of what's going on or how this could be and his nature is mysterious but he has some patterns right we know god is characteristically very um, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Meaning, he has characteristics that we can rely on. That he is truth. That uh, he is everywhere. That uh, he knows everything. That uh, he is all powerful. He is a creator being. Those things are true. Those things stand the test of time. And so what we want to concentrate on tonight must stem from that inerrant knowledge that truth because if we miss the character and the nature of god as one who does not lie 
and will be able to assist us through our lives where we're going. Then we'll miss the whole point of why we should be obedient to him. If we can find somebody who is pure and always just, bringing equality and equity to wherever he's going, and who will not ever lead you astray, then it will be very easy for us to um, follow such a person, such a being, to go along the paths that he intends, right? The only problem is that we we have lives where we, you know, are always let down, are always disappointed. We always meet upon persons who we, we um, expect the best of and they, they may let us down or do something that we thought they would not have done. Or, um, or life shows itself to whether we're in a relational aspect or doing things in community where some things go bad and we think the worst of people. Please, I'm going to implore you tonight that you still do not give up hope. Uh, one, on people because there are times when some things will happen and people need time to come back out of bad habits to remember the good motives of God. And maybe you who are around who know better are the ones who will assist them. One. And two, um, you must know that God, who is sovereign, even though things may be going bad around you, or you may have been uh, hurt or uh, let down or disappointed in some way, has some reason for those things to be happening either to be building you up to where you need to be or for some things in the environment to go back to, to right. The sad truth is that many times you don't see the fullness of God until things get very bad or the, the worst happens. And it is then that we remember and turn ourselves and rend our hearts back to God. So don't lose heart. Find a way to not only be obedient to God, but also assist those around you to know his word enough to do the same. As we reflect on our first Bible scripture, let us um, get ready for God's word here. Psalm 40 speaks to us about things written in the volume of his book. Let me try to project the screen here. Let me know if you're still hearing my voice and still seeing what is projected on the screen. And uh, let me enlarge the screen a little. As it says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth and a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, there would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. So this is a cry for 
God to still show mercy and faithfulness despite the troubles around and the sins of our lives. You will see that in this latter section here, in verses 10 to 12. But it's also a testament to how we should be ready to start to do some of the will of God, to, to be obedient to him. Because if we look very closely in verses uh, 6, it says that the sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. During the Jewish tradition, as you well know, if you're in the Christian tradition or the Jewish tradition currently, they used to give burnt offerings. Um, the high priest would go into the temple. And from the days of Abel and stretching on to Noah, the only way to recompense for the sins of our lives was to sacrifice an animal, the best we could find without blemish whether it is a goat or uh, a sheep or a dove, whatever your um, class or standing in life. And at the point of shedding the blood and giving the things in relation to the sacrifice to God, it was a way to be obedient to him, but show your atonement for your sins. And through the Levites, as Moses gathered more about things in relation to the laws of God and heard more from him. That tradition continued. And what happened when Jesus died was that he, being very sinless and faultless and blameless, perfect human, because he was not just a human or man, but God also, he died on our behalf and shed his blood but did not stay there. He rose from the dead through the power of the Holy Spirit. And because he now is the perfect sacrifice for all of our sins, we do not have to go through the high priest and all the bloods of the bulls and the goats anymore. Because we have somebody who was perfect and blameless than anything else that we could ever have sacrificed. We have a perfect offering. And so we now are beholden to him. So you see, right here when it speaks about the things in relation to sin offerings and keeping our ears open, yes, during the time of uh, the psalmist, they had to do these things. But what God was trying to show more is that you want to follow laws in relation to what I've required with sacrifice and offerings and the oblations. But what's going on with your mind and your heart? Are you going to just sacrifice, sacrifice and do some things around you over and over without actually doing the things around you that will cause you not to even want to be doing the sacrifice? Obviously, you will sin, right? But are you following God's word? Are you following what he intends for your life? Are you trying to go on his paths? Are you in the way of obedience? And if we are obedient, then there will be no need for the sacrifices. Samuel himself had to say to Saul these same words that obedience is better or greater than sacrifice he said it to him at a point when saul decided to sacrifice some offerings um which he was not supposed to and samuel had not come up as yet as the high priest assist before they had gone to war right or after they had come from war many of the old testament prophets say very similar things amos said so in some of the writings of his books and some of the others in the in the mine, especially in the minor prophet tradition, that this thing where they were very traditional and religious and not realizing the very nature of doing the things of the, the law entailing to love in your neighbors as yourself 
I'm going out and being obedient to his word was greater than all the sacrifices and all the things that you would ever do in the traditional um, ways of doing it. The whole point of it was for you to realize your sin and turn and repent and then come to God for him to lead you to where you were to go. The whole point was not the sacrifices. The whole point was what it meant. The whole point was not the shedding of the blood. The whole point was the one who would come, who would ultimately put all sin to death with the shedding of his blood. The whole point was not the tradition of the, the bulls and the goats and the things in relation to the offering. The whole point was the one who brought those things to us so that we can reflect on him and know who we are serving. I hope you're getting me. Because if we are going to be ready to do God's will, which I'm going to reflect on right now, where it says in verse 7, let me project it back. Here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is written in my heart. If you look very closely, it is um, in uh, apostrophes there as if somebody has spoken. Of course, a person spoke into, speaking to the prophet or the psalmist here is Jesus Christ himself. He is the only one who would have been able to go through life without the natures of sin. The very volume of the scrolls of all of the things in relation to prophecy relate to him. He started it, he will end it. He started it, it speaks of him. <laughs> and he came and did the very things that it intended. And so now, because he has laid down his life for you, He's asking you to do the same things in relation to going out and being obedient. It is not going to be a very easy task. But the world and all the things around you will, will do its thing and move on and do its thing. But it must end and come back to the one who created it in the first place. The Lord says some things to us, and sometimes, sometimes it is hard enough because, let me clarify, many times it is not hard. The whole point of what he's saying is to make our lives easier. But because of how we have been ingrained in sin, because of how the world around us does some things or says some things that look right, it gives us some pleasure, you know, it, it satiates or being a little with something to taste or see that is pleasurable or hear that sounds nice. But in the end, as the book itself says, it leads to destruction many times. It leads to our undoing. It leads to the fact that many times we think we are on the path that makes some sense. But if it is of not, not of God, are following the things in relation to the word of God, then all of a sudden we have entered a pathway of sin and evil. And how do we get back to where we need to go? Let's read from Isaiah. Isaiah says, listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he will form me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, 
and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant. To restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down. Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. So you see the, the point here. The Lord says some things to us in relation to who we are, what we are capable of doing. He says that if we follow him, if we listen to what he says, then... Even though we are abhorred by those who are around us, eventually they will come to see that we are the faithful ones following the God who is chosen. In fact, at one point, it says, kings will see you and stand up. Can you imagine that? It says, listen to me, the first verse. You islands, hear this. You distant nations, before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. Are we ready to listen to God enough that it reaches to the stage where we seem and act so differently? The whole point of you seeing, being seen and acted differently is that you will unfortunately be hated, just like Jesus and many of the apostles and the disciples. You will unfortunately be mocked, call all sorts of names, thought as, you know, the strange. The whole point of the apostles many times saying you are a peculiar people. The apostle uh, Peter said so, a holy nation, a royal priesthood is that you should stand out that as God has shown in the Bible, you will be like a remnant from those who are there. A, a, a set of persons set apart for him. How can you be so if you're like what the world intends and what is going on around you? How can you assist to lead people back to the parts of where they need to be if you yourself are engrossed in the same thing? How can you be of this world and presume to get the things of God? You, you see the point that, the, that Isaiah is saying here. And we, we have no problems listening, you know. In Jamaica, per square mile, we have the most churches in the entire world. The counterpart to that, it is said, is that we also have the, the most bars per uh, square mile. Uh, because at every corner or section there is either a church or a bar or a, you know a little get together here but the the counter to it yes people must be there and doing some things is that we also have a very violent nation that the the very um word seems sometimes not to be permeating out of course it must be doing what it is doing god is god and uh, he must be doing some work and allowing some things to happen. But can we really reflect and do what God intends? Not just listen or hear it. One of the apostles in the New Testament says, let us not just be, you know, hearers of the word, but do us also. Let us not go into the mirror look into the face 
of who we think we are. And then as soon as we turn away and look the other way, we have gone back to the parts of the, the bad things that we were doing before. There is, there, there has got to be a stopping point. There's got to be some way that we have reflected enough in God to say, no, this is where the book stops. This is where I stop being angry at every single little thing that, that comes up in my life. This is where I, I lay down the bitterness of something that happened to me two or three decades ago. This is where I lay down some of the addictions that I've used to satiate some of the traumas from the past of my life. This is where I learn forgiveness. This is where I stop going around trying to chase the things of the world, whether it is something relationally, whether it is something in the financial sphere of life. This is where I come out of this tired, fatigued, frustrated feeling that I have. There will come a point where you think you're at your wit's end, where you think uh, you know, the worst is about to be happening, but it's actually the turning point. You may think you're at the worst, but once you start to reflect and realize that these things are happening and something has to change, this is the point when God is going to be starting to pour into you and speak of what you need to be doing. And you dare not not listen. Because this is where not only you will change or start to transform or become who we intended you to be, but this is where everything that has been connected to you will start to crack and break and move back into the repairing of what is required. Do you know that what your life is, it's a composite of the things that you are connected with? If you are supposed to break apart and transform into the fullness of obedience to God. All of a sudden, man, you will start to see some things start to move and shift around you that you thought was holding you, which, which some people think, unfortunately, or you think was pushing you back, or that you thought was a curse in your life. But it starts at this point and you get to the other side by obeying God's word. And you can't obey God's word unless you start to know what is right and wrong and who it is that you should be following. As I said before we started all of this discussion, and Mary, Jesus Christ's earthly mother, give a very simple command as such. That the first of the signs that Jesus would leave on earth was to show something what no other human will probably ever be able to do. Even though he said that we, we ourselves will do miracles and um, do some things greater than him. The, the whole point of him saying that is that uh, he, he of course, um, was just here for three years. Three years. Okay, let me explain that better. He obviously was here for 30 odd years. But in his maturity, coming into his priesthood in 30 after he was baptized, his ministry, or where a person saw him fully and he started to proclaim more about the good news, was just three years until he, he died and was crucified. But he made such a, a fuss and a furore that they had to get this guy. He, he, as Caiaphas proclaimed, was about to turn the heart of the people. 
which he obviously already did and still continues to do. You cannot stop Jesus. He was changing the way persons started to think and realize about who they are and what they should be doing. As the, um, the psalmist proclaimed, it was never about the sacrifices and the offerings and the things. It was about what you're doing to obey God. And so when we reach this section, let me pro project back, John, and then get back to this point. When we get to this point, we have to realize how Mary even got it. Before I get there, we have to realize how Mary got to this point where she said, do whatever he tells you. Or in fact, where another version says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. <laughs> and You know, this little dialogue between um, Jesus and his mother was so illustrative because um, here he is, you know, just sitting lounging around with some of his friends and those who is about to call into ministry. And they were at a wedding, you know, just unusual social affair that we all go to in our lives. And something very simple happens, which happens many times at events, where, you know, maybe the food runs out and you have to call it a night and another hour you sit and play some more dominoes or uh, listen to some good music. Uh, drink some some more water or whatever and say, all right, later, guys, and you, you pack up because all the food is finished and the night is about to end. But there is always more with God. There's always an abundance of things that we cannot see when the obedience comes in. That is one of the things God represented. But he also demonstrated the magnificence of his power. How is it that you're able to have a, a canister here that um, I, I sometimes sip as I'm speaking, right? It has some water. And I cannot imagine ever just touching or speaking to it, which Jesus never even did in that situation, which we're about to describe. And it changes its, its chemistry totally into something different, like a, like a bottle of um, non-alcoholic wine or something. I can't even imagine it. This is how amazing this first miracle was. And if you miss, if you miss the beauty of him being able to even control nature, then you miss the point of who Jesus is. You miss the point of why you should be obedient to him in the first place. You want to go against somebody who can change water to wine? You want to not listen to somebody who never even touched or spoke to the water, but just told some men to change some jars and pour it out into the next, and then something just changed magnificently. You want to not listen to somebody who um, saves the best tasting thing for last. This. It may sound ironic or laughable as I'm saying it, but you realize the irony of our lives? That you know Jesus is, is this magnificent, beautiful, capable being. And we do the exact opposite of what he says all the time. Yet what he intends is for this sweet tasting wine to come to us. For our lives to come to the fullness of where we can be. But if we don't follow him, if we don't uh, allow him to do his work, then how are we going to see what, what we can get out of life? How are we going to see it? Watch this now. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. 
Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So, he will always bring his signs in you know? It was, uh, he will always show some things in relation to ways and what he can do for you. But you must move from the stage of listening, of believing, of being in wonderment, of um, seeing some things and loving God and actually doing what he says. 20 to 30 gallons of water in each of those six charge. I don't even know if the amount of people who were at that wedding, you know, could even finish the amount of gallons of stuff that was there. I don't even know how it is that they didn't see the relevance of this ceremonial washing, another traditional thing which we're talking about. Being converted into something that will go into you to give you sweet taste. It says when the Holy Spirit comes, that the entirety of your being will bubble up into ever-flowing living water. It says that the very nature of God is meant to transform you so that you can live your lives greater than you could ever imagine. We have to move away from that stage. We have two issues. Either it is that we don't do what God says and meander along and end up on the wrong path. Or it is that we want to do good, but we stay in the prayer mode and the hoping mode, waiting for a miracle as if we, we presume that every day God is going to change the, um, the six jars with 20 to 30 gallons of water each back to wine and change our lives for us. When many times we are the ones who should go and do some things that he has told us to do. His spirit is moving and working, yes. But are we going to wait on a miracle every day when we can do some things? He says, go and do some things that I have intended you to do. Do what you can do through God's strength. And then allow him to do the things around you that you can't do. God can assist to calm you down so you are more at peace and less angry. But are you going to wait on a miracle to show you that you shouldn't be angry before you, you, you decide not to be indignant with everybody around you and not be angry unjustly? You see where I'm going? God can see some things in the world in relation to wars and issues of non-peace and people fighting and breaking apart each other. But what can we do? We can go out and we can do our diplomatic work in the communities and in the nations, talk to each other and try to come to some impasse of peace. There are people who do these things. Right, they, they, you know, some people don't even understand the need for these things. There are people who go out into the communities, whether they're social workers or doctors, or um, people who may be part of the security forces, who have to sit and talk to people, or unfortunately secure areas, so that bad things do not happen. What can you do? Are you going to wait on a miracle? 
you go into a test. You, you're going to presume that you're not going to study or figure out what it is your teacher has told you and maybe go through some past papers, figure out your brain a little, um, try to memorize some things, practice before you go in, and then pray for God to remind you what to do to go in. Are you just going to just lackadaisical, not do anything, and then go in the test and presume you're going to pass? You see where I'm going? Do what God has told you to be. Don't be lazy and worrisome and slack with your lives. Do what you can do through God's strength. And the things that you can't do, God will assist you and move on and shift some things. And then you will see some of the goodness in your lives. Huh? Let me, let me try another example. Are you going, if you're in a stage where uh, maybe your, your kid's not so, you know, not doing maybe what you intend. And uh, you have a, a whole sort of people around you. You have a school community. You have elders who you can talk to. You have church members. You have some knowledge in yourself. You're not going to reach out, talk to some of the people then. You go and talk to them yourself. Maybe try to get some counseling if it's an emotional issue the young person is going through. Maybe try to give some advice of some places that they can, you know, sort out whatever issue is, is causing them to be in turmoil. Maybe assist them to start working in community where they will stay calm enough to not be, uh, you know, causing chaos around and become deviants that eventually become criminals in our society. You can do some things. Many times we think we can't, you know, and we, we sit praying and hoping for the best. But God is saying that you are my people who are called by name. Humble yourself and pray. And I will, what? Hear from heaven. And then heal you. There are times when it is too much for you. You have to sit down and concentrate on some things for God and pray and figure some things out. But my God, don't stay there for a season and a half and a two season and a half and a three season and a half. God is asking you to do that in tandem with co-laboring with him in, in the world. Many times you have enough knowledge of the things you need to do. The Bible has knowledge. People who are around you who can mentor you have some knowledge. Follow God's path as best as you can. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He is leading you on some paths for his name's sake. Suppose when uh, Mary had said to her son, do whatever he tells you. And, uh, you know, Jesus, obviously Jesus is going to follow his mother, even though it was kind of a, a weird uh, discussion between him. Woman, it's not my time yet. And then he does tell the servants to do something. And then they say, what is this guy? Why am I supposed to be lifted up jars and throwing up water? What, what is this nonsense? And then just gone about their business. They wouldn't have seen it, right? God always tricks you by using what you have ah, and then producing the miracle, right? He, 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 he makes it seem as if you make it seem like you don't have anything or you don't have enough. And then he brings you into co-laboring with him, giving you some things to him. You give his thing, your things to him. And then something is produced. He did the same thing when he changed the two fishes and the loaves to uh, to feed 5,000 men uh, beside women, right? He did the same thing when he fed 5,000. did the same thing when he fed 4,000. He used what you had, multiplied it to the fullness of where it could be. You see the point? So please, 
be obedient to God. But use the very natures of what is around you. Follow God through it. And you will get to where you need to go. Let me concentrate on the last bit of scripture here very quickly. 1 Corinthians 1. And it says this. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth. Those sanctified in Christ, Jesus, and called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you. Because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus, for in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God does confirm in our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You are waiting patiently for some things, it says. But it says also that you are faithful, God is faithful, sorry, and has called you into fellowship with him. It says, he will also keep you firm till the end. Did it say, did it say he, God is faithful and then end there? It says you are in fellowship with God. Did it say, that you are eagerly waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ alone. No, it says you have spiritual gifts to go and do some things. So do. Know who you are. Know that you have been kindly asked to do some things with God. He will lead you and give you the strength that you need. But you have to be obedient to the voice. Not just listen, not just hear, not just meander around and in the traditions of it, for, you know, in the sense, image, just eventually just follow the culture. Just follow, follow, follow things. Follow back. You know, in Jamaica, we have this term of follow back a man and things like that. No, not do that. Follow Jesus. And then you will see the fullness of where you could be. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for bringing us closer to the greatness of who we can be. We ask that you come into our lives to transform it and change our minds so that we can be obedient and follow your word. Let us not just be traditional or follow worse, follow the culture or the things around us, but follow you, follow your path and allow you as a shepherd to change us, not just baptize us, with the water, but fill us with the Holy Ghost power, gifts and abilities to do your word and glorify you. Amen. Good night, everybody. Thank you again for tuning in for Tuesday night Bible study. I hope you learned and gained some things here. We read from uh, a few main scriptures, but I also reflected from something from James where he said we should be um, doers of the word and not hearers also. Please do tune in next week. We're going to have a bit of a uh, um, song right now. But please tune in as we uh, reflect on what will be coming next week this time. Tonight, God deserves to be lifted up. He deserves to be worshipped. He deserves to be honored and to be adored. As we worship Him tonight, I invite you to just join in with this worship selection. Oh, be lifted above other gods. We
Good night again. And uh, as we close, please note that next week we'll be having a special uh, bit of uh, Bible study where the ladies will be having their Women's Fellowship Week. So we will actually be in the sanctuary and be a, doing a little bit of a, a Bible quiz, so to speak. The the um, the phrase in here or the, the theme or the topic will be women rooted in Christ bearing fruit. That is next week, Tuesday. Same time. And um, uh, the time may be a little earlier, and we will we will let everybody know as, as Sunday comes. But please do know we'll be reflecting from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, which talks about the fruit of the Spirit, as we see here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Women, please do reach out to your uh, group leaders and figure out what it is that you're doing in relation to Hannah and Priscilla and Esther and uh, I can't remember all of the 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 main female um, leads that will be used for the five groups but please do come through and let's have some fun in Christ and um, um, worship and fellowship together big up all persons here from Hillshire United Church and also those who have tuned in with us thank you so much remember you are gods, and you have some abilities to do some things in his obedience. Follow him, man, and all of a sudden, some things will start happening for you. Do whatever he tells you, and it will be well with you in our lives. Amen. <laughs>